Well, good morning, church. And may I say once again, Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We are here today to celebrate the resurrection of Christ Jesus, the empty tomb, the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus when he said that the Son of God would be raised in three days. Praise the Lord. Let all heaven rejoice that Jesus Christ is alive. Let all people here at sunlight this morning praise and rejoice that Jesus Christ is alive. Give him praise this morning. Amen. Amen. And, and that thought alone, that thought alone should put a huge smile on our face and put a peace in our heart because death has been defeated. And you and I have the opportunity to be forgiven of the sin in our life and to live eternally with Christ. Amen? Amen. We're here today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that Jesus is not dead? How many of you know that the tomb is empty? How many of you know that Christ is alive? There's an excitement in the sanctuary this morning. And there should be a great excitement in the church today, not just here, but all across the church. We're finishing a series here that we started several weeks ago called Passion. And throughout this series, we learned that loving others is a tough business. So often our love is tied to how we feel or, or how our wants or our needs are being met. And when our feelings change or our wants and our needs are no longer being met, then, then our love changes as well. And this is called conditional love. And thankfully, that isn't the kind of love that God has for his children. God's love and the love that, he was, that was shown by Jesus is an unconditional love. God loves even when it's unreciprocated. God loves even when he's not getting anything out of the relationship. God's love is evident in the sacrifice he made by sending his only son, Jesus, so that through him all who believe may have eternal life. You remember what it says in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But Jesus had to willingly come. He humbled himself and became obedient to the will of the Father. And this obedience led Jesus to his eventual death on a cross. And today, on Easter Sunday, we celebrate that the death of Jesus wasn't the end of the story. I'm here to let you know that not even the grave could hold him. The soldiers could not hold him. The crowds could not stop him. The nails could not hold him to that cross. Even the grave was not satisfactory to hold him. Jesus overcame it all and was resurrected from the dead. And as followers of Christ, we identify with his death as we give up our old lives and identify with his resurrection as we embrace his spirit living in us. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would ask that you please turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. If you do not have your Bibles with you this morning, you can use one of the pew Bibles in front of you. You can use your electronic Bible if you desire, or follow along on the screen. But that's where we're going to be, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. But before we read that passage, allow me to share with you just a little background. All four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, include the story of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So today, I want to read for you the words that were spoken just after he had been resurrected, just after they found that he was not in the grave anymore. Some of the women who had followed Jesus when he was alive went to the tomb on that first Easter morning. And they did not find what they were thinking they were going to find. They did not find his body. Instead, they found two men dressed in clothes that gleamed like lightning. And this is what it says, starting in verse 1 of chapter 24. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces on the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. That's, that's good news, amen? amen? This should make our hearts beat a little faster because these ladies went to the tomb expecting to find a dead body, but instead they were told that Jesus was not there, that he had risen. Not even the grave itself could hold him. In fact, nothing was going to stop him because what Jesus was exhibiting at this very moment was an unstoppable love. An unstoppable love that nothing and no one was ever going to stop. I mean, think back to all the people and all the things that, that tried to stop Jesus. I mean, the devil tried to stop him. The religious leaders who turned him in tried to stop him. The crowds tried to stop him. Even the nails in his hands and feet on the cross tried to stop him, but they could not stop him because upon his resurrection, Jesus was, had overcome death itself. And in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Chances are, chances are there may be something in your life right now that if you allow it to, will attempt you to stop following Jesus. It's going to tempt you to stop following him. Maybe it's something that, that you've been dealing with for a long time. Maybe it's been a distraction for years. You've fought with the idea of accepting Christ in your life many times, but every time you think about it, this distraction stops you. Maybe it's some repetitive sin that keeps drawing you back into that. Maybe it's a person in your life that tells you that accepting Jesus Christ in your life is a ridiculous choice. Why would you want to do that? Why embrace him when the world has so much pleasure to offer you? Whatever it is, distractions are normal for all of us. In fact, the world is full of them. But just like we talked about last week, we have to keep our eyes focused on the cross. And although numerous things may have acted as temporary setbacks, the truth is that nothing can negate God's love for us. And the key word in that last statement is nothing. Listen to this verse from Romans 8, 38 and 39. It says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from that. That unstoppable love that Christ has for all of his creation cannot be stopped. What a powerful message. Paul says that there's nothing in all the creation that can separate us from God's love for us. And this should allow us to live a free life, not having to worry about things, not stressing about how we will pay the high price for our sin, but once again to be reconciled to God. For you see, if there is nothing that stands in the way between you and God, that sin that is in your life right now can be gotten away from, can be given away to him, and it's not going to stop because he loves you in spite of who we are and what we are. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, first, I think we have to follow Christ's model and die to sin. We must repent and push our sin as far from our lives as the East is from the West. But the trouble is, and some of you here today are wondering this very thing, what does dying to sin actually look like? 
When you say we need to die to sin, what, what does that mean? Well, there once was a man who asked George Mueller the secret of his service, and Mueller responded, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, died to his opinions, died to his preferences, died to his taste and his will, died to the world, its approval or censure, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since that time, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. There comes a time where we have to put ourselves aside, we have to put everything about us aside, and we have to turn it all over to God. That is dying to sin. The concept of dying to self is found throughout the New Testament. It expresses the true essence of the Christian life in which we take up our cross and follow Christ. Dying to self is part of being born again. The old self dies. The new self comes to life. And not only are Christians born again when we come to salvation, but we also continue dying to self as part of the process of sanctification. As such, dying to self is both a one-time event and a lifelong process. Jesus spoke repeatedly to his disciples about taking up their cross and following him. He made it clear that if anyone would follow him, they must deny themselves, which means giving up their lives spiritually, symbolically, and even physically if necessary. This was a prerequisite for being a follower of Christ who proclaimed that trying to save our earthly lives would result in our losing our lives in the kingdom. But those who would give up their lives for his sake would find eternal life. Paul explains to the Galatians the process of dying to self as one in which we have been crucified with Christ and now Paul no longer, and now Christ no longer is, is away from us, but he lives in us. Paul said his old life with his propensity to sin and to follow the ways of the world was dead. He left it behind. And the new Paul is the dwelling place of Christ who lives in and through him. And that's what we need to be as Christians. We need to say the old way that I live, the old things that I used to do, the things that were sin against God are now gone. And now Christ lives in me and his way is the way I follow. Maybe this Easter, maybe this Easter is the first time that you sense the desire to resist the urge to sin against God and ask him into your heart. Maybe for the first time in your life, this Easter is that time. The Bible tells us that, that the Holy Spirit living within us because of our act of repentance from sin and asking God to come inside of us will provide us with the power to resist that sin and find a way out. So if dying to our sin and trusting the work of the Holy Spirit is step one, what about step two? Well, we already know that Christ did not stay dead. The grave was unable to hold him. So what does it mean for us that he is alive today? What this means is because Christ was victorious over the grave and the death that it allows us the opportunity to live for him and not just live for him here, but to live eternally with him in heaven. By that empty grave being there, Christ tells us that because he came back, because he overcame death, we also can overcome that death that takes place and we can live with him forever. The challenge for us as believers and followers of Christ is to learn how to live for him each and every day. In the Gospel of Luke 9.23, or we are reminded of this, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now this may seem like a simple statement, but it doesn't involve just words. Living for Christ takes very real action as indicated by this passage from Luke and the others in the New Testament. In fact, in James 1.22, we find these words that says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. 
which means that when we ask Christ into our life, when we ask him to forgive us of our sin, when we ask him to take all of those things away from us, and we say we're going to live for you this day, Lord, that, that he gives us the opportunity to be able to do that, and we know how we are supposed to live by reading his word, listening to his word, and then doing what it says. The Bible is meant to be an act is, is to act as our guide concerning how we are to live in Christ. It tells us the sins to watch out for. It lets us know the type of fruit that should be born out of our lives. It tells us what kind of community to seek out. It tells us to trust in him and not live in fear. There is a great and powerful instruction all throughout the Bible. But the scriptures aren't just meant to stop at divine instruction. They are meant to inspire us onto abundant and faithful living. In John 10:10, 10, 10, it says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. God's desire is that we experience abundant life now through the powerful sacrifice the unstoppable, the unconditional, the sacrificial, the humble, the perfect love of his son, Jesus. And in stark contrast to this stands the devil who seeks nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. This decision to accept or reject Christ truly is one or the other. You either, there are not multiple options, there are not multiple scenarios. You either accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior with the promise of life eternal in heaven, or you reject Christ and know that your destination is hell. That promise of eternal life is due to the fact that we come today and celebrate that the tomb is empty. And when we celebrate that the tomb is empty, it gives us power, it gives us hope, it gives us joy, it gives us a promise. It gives us the opportunity to not live in fear. You know, there's a praise chorus that we sing that talks about no more fear. Fear is a, is a terrible thing. Because fear is something that can come in and take inside of us. And Satan loves nothing more than to put fear into your heart. Because if there is fear in your heart, then you are going to question whether God is what he says he is and who he says he is. And the dichotomy of a, of a serene peace, knowing that heaven awaits versus the intense fear of an eternity in hell is one that I can relate to. There's nothing more in my life than I want is a, is a serene peace that comes over me in all situations. It doesn't matter what happens. And that peace can only happen when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. June 13th, 2013 is a day that I will forever remember. I was lying on a gurney in the pre-op area of Lutheran Hospital's Heart Center. Anyone knows me and knows me well knows that I'm an emotional person. And several weeks before that morning, I had been told that, that I had a heart valve that needed to be replaced. I also had an aneurysm on the main artery of my heart. And both of those things needed to be taken care of as soon as possible. Now, the shock of hearing that news was hard to hear, but, but through the process of all the testing and the preparation, I really did not have a sense of fear. And for someone who is emotional, that is really sort of unheard of. I had questions about the procedure. I had plenty of questions. But I don't ever remember being fearful. The one thing that I did think about was what was going to take place when they wheeled me out of that prep area, leaving my family behind. I thought, now that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. I did not fear dying because of a decision that I had made earlier in my life about giving my life to Christ. It was a time where I said, okay, I'm going to live for you, Christ. I'm going to die to self. I'm going to live for you. So that decision told me that there was something better for me than being here if I was thinking this was it. 
So I, I, I never feared dying through the whole thing. But on that June morning, as they came in and said that it was time to go, we told each other that we loved each other and that we would see each other later. But you never know, do you? Being that emotional person, I felt that this would be the time when my emotions would get the best of me, but it didn't happen. Instead, there was this tremendous, almost supernatural peace that washed over me like I had never felt before. Because I knew that God was right there with me and that even if I did not make it, I knew where I was going and I knew where I was gonna reside for all of eternity. All made possible by that empty tomb. A Couple of months ago on February 16th, I found myself once again in Lutheran Hospital facing emergency surgery, this time on my leg. The surgeon told Pat and I what he believed was going on with my leg and what was going to happen and what he was going to find when he began the surgery. And then he said this. He said, I must tell you that if it is bad, if it is as bad as I think, it might be possible that you'll lose your leg. I'm not sure what you're supposed to feel or experience or even think at a time like that. But once again, I felt this intense calmness and peace that I experienced nine years earlier. I was wheeled into the operating room and all I felt was a peace that was only possible when Jesus Christ is living inside of you and Jesus Christ is guiding and directing you and Jesus Christ is making the calls for your life. Now thankfully, and I thank God for this, I didn't lose my leg. But if I would have, I still knew that God was gonna take care of me. And the only way possible to be able to experience that kind of peace is by having Christ in your life. You can't experience that kind of peace if you've never accepted Christ in your life because there's always going to be fear. Satan is always going to stick fear into your life. He's always going to say, God's not going to take care of you. You can't overcome this. But because of the empty tomb, we can overcome anything. For those of you who have accepted Christ into your life, I pray that you have also experienced that type of peace. But for those who have not accepted Christ, you may be thinking, I thought that when you accepted Christ into your heart that you would not have any problems or any temptations or anything ever again in your life. If that is what you're thinking, then you are, how do I say this, uh, wrong. <laughs> Accepting in Christ into your life does not keep you from trials or problems or temptations. Accepting Christ into your life gives you the peace and the calm and the promise that Jesus will be right beside you during those times so there is no need to fear because he's going to be there with you every step of the way. When you live in Christ, you can rest in the assurance that your destination is heaven and there is no more peaceful place anywhere. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty so that those who accept Christ can live in this world without fear because when the time comes to leave this world, heaven awaits and that is where peace comes from. But in my life, I have witnessed many people that have chosen to stay far away from Christ. They desire to do things in their own way. They want to call the shots in their life. They want nothing to do with anything of God. They want nothing to get in their way of living the life they desire to live. But here's the good news. Even with all the things and the roadblocks that those people tried to put in God's way, God is still calling them and God is still saying, I love you 
and I want you to be with me. Because the love of Jesus is unstoppable, it's, uncomp- uh, it's unconquerable, and it's unyielding. Today you may be sitting in this sanctuary saying that you want nothing to go- do with God, and God is saying, I still love you, and I'll always love you. That's why the tomb was empty. His love is far greater than some tomb with a large boulder rolled in front of it. Easter Sunday is such a special time for us to to celebrate our collective freedom. It's a day to remember our individual testimonies, a day to celebrate and commemorate all that God has brought us through as individuals and as a community. And as we've learned throughout this service, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was fueled first and foremost by unconditional agape love. Christ was humble. He was obedient. And his life for us was perfected 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross only to be raised to life three days later. As believers, the empty tomb is where we find fullness of life. But for some in the sanctuary and online today, there is simply nothing more than an empty life for them. Their experience of life is a monotonous one of repetition, actions devoid of any hope, joy, and if you're honest with yourself, the unconditional love that has been described here today. But the good news, actually the greatest news, is that the experience of those who were described as lost, God says, I want you to be found. I want you as mine. And that abundant fullness of life in Christ is available to any and all who believe in him. As Jesus was being tortured and whipped before the actual crucifixion, it was said that there was so much blood on the ground that day that there were people who were actually soaking it up with rags. That blood that was shed before and during the crucifixion was shed for all of us. That blood covered and removed the sins in our lives when the decision was made by us to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. When we ask him for the forgiveness of our sin, it was given. There was no questions asked. When we ask Christ to forgive us, it happens instantly. Elise and the team are going to come and they're going to share a song entitled, Thank You Jesus for the Blood. And I wanna share with you before they sing the first verse with you as they come. And this is what it says, it says, I was a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. You made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. I don't know where you are at this morning in your relationship and your life with Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never asked Christ to forgive you of the sin in your life or ask him to come live in you and guide you and direct you. If that's the case, then I'm going to ask you to make a bold move. And as the team is singing this morning, I'm going to ask that you just come to the altar this morning while the song is being sung and allow someone to pray with you as you accept Christ into your life. Knowing full well that the person who is praying for you has been in your spot before because there was a time they came to accept Christ for the first time. So I'm gonna ask you to take a a bold step this morning. 
But maybe you're here this morning and at one time you asked Christ into your life, but you've walked away from him. And quite honestly, your life is a mess and you need to get it made right again. I would ask you to do the same bold thing and come to the altar of prayer this morning and allow someone to pray with you. Knowing full well that that person who is praying for you has been in your position before. Because they too have made decisions that may have caused them to take another track for a while, but then they came back. And the Lord accepted them, and that unconditional love, that unstoppable love was given to them once again. So I don't want you to think that if you've made a mess of your life that you can't come back to him because that's exactly what he's offering you to do. Or maybe for some of you this morning, you just need to come to the altar and tell Jesus thank you for the blood that has been shed for you. However God is speaking to you during this song, I don't, I don't want you to sing. There's going to be any words on the screen. I just, want you, I just want you to thank God for the blood that has been shed for you. And I, if you are asking and God has been speaking to you about coming forward this morning, don't allow Satan to stop you. Don't allow that distraction to stop you come and allow Christ's unstoppable love to fill you this morning.